Good morning and thank you for joining us for our online service from Unity Baptist Church in Champaign, Illinois. Uh, last week we talked about uh, pursuing joy in our lives and what that means and the fact that it is available <clears throat> to every believer in Jesus Christ. Uh, we have the joy of the Lord, but we have to nurture that joy. Today I'm going to talk about maintaining our joy. I want you to turn, if you will, in your Bibles to the book of Nehemiah, chapter 8 and verse number 10. And uh, while you're finding that, because Nehemiah isn't one of the more familiar books with most people in the Bible, but it is a tremendous book. It's a, uh, a history book, essentially, of, of the work of God through a man by the name of Nehemiah. And it's a great book on, on leadership and uh, about uh, a man whose uh, main uh, occupation in life was not uh, building by any stretch. Uh, he was the cupbearer of King Xerxes, but he was surrendered to the Lord, had a passion for the people of God, and was used of God to do something really amazing. And we'll talk about this uh, in the message today for just a moment. But in Nehemiah chapter eight and verse number 10, it says, then he said to them, go and eat what is rich, drink what is sweet, and send portions to those who have nothing prepared, since today is holy to our Lord. Do not grieve, and here's the point that I want to make and the, the phrase that I want to point out to us today and use as a sort of starting point for uh, the message today. He says, do not grieve because the joy of the Lord is your strength. Israel had been in captivity to Babylon for 70 years. The prophet Jeremiah had had said they would be in chapter 25 of his prophecy, verses 11 and 12. And then the, then the return of Israel to the land of Israel began. They began to return after uh, the, the empire of Babylon was overthrown and taken over by Medo-Persia. Then it, they began to release the captives to go back to their homeland if they wanted to do that. The return took place in three stages and was led by three really incredible and unique men, men of great leadership and men of great faith. The first one was Zerubbabel. Zerubbabel is in the line of Christ if you follow the genealogies in the Bible. And in 538 BC, he led the first group of of 49,897 uh, former slaves and captives and singers, according to Ezra chapter two. He also had some members of the 10 Northern tribes of Israel that had been taken captive by the Assyrians many, many years before. And he went for the purpose of rebuilding the temple. Remember when the Babylonians took the kingdom uh, of of Judah, uh, they destroyed everything pretty much in Jerusalem, and particularly uh, they destroyed that beautiful temple that Solomon had built. They just uh, took it clear down to the foundations, and so uh, they had destroyed that. So, so Zerubbabel <clears throat> wanted to go back, and he wanted to rebuild the temple. This first return was not all peaches and cream for Zerubbabel, believe me. Uh, and the reason for that is because this new temple that they built, that Zerubbabel led in the building of, uh, really didn't live up to the expectations of those people who are old enough to remember the glory of Solomon's temple. And so they complained, it's too small, it isn't as, as pretty as the other temple, and so on and so forth. Zechariah, the prophet, says that they despise the day of small things. And this was a, a, a difficult period. It took a very long time to get everybody together to finally build this temple. 
So some 80 years after Zerubbabel left, left that left Babylon and returned to Israel uh, in order to build the temple, 80 years later, Ezra, the priest and the scribe in 458 BC, was allowed to invite by the king of Persia, he was allowed to invite as many Jews as wanted to, to go back to the land of Israel. <clears throat> and he led the return of this second group of captives in order to instruct the people, his purpose, Ezra's purpose was to instruct the people in the law of God and in the regulations that the law set out for the worship of the Lord in the temple that Zerubbabel had built. In spite of the appeals of this good man, and he was a good man, in spite of Ezra's appeal, appeals, only 1,754 men responded in all of the kingdom of Persia. Only 1,754 men responded and agreed to go back to Israel to help Ezra, Ezra in his purpose. He was heartbroken. But after much instruction from God's word, the people of, of Israel repented of their sins, they abandoned their evil ways, and they returned to the Lord. And so the mission of Ezra was accomplished as well. <clears throat> and then finally, in 445 BC, about 15 years after, or not quite, maybe 13 years after Ezra, had had instituted the worship of the Lord once again in the temple. Nehemiah, a palace official in the court of King Xerxes of Persia, received permission from the king to go back to Jerusalem and rebuild the walls or rebuild the defenses of the city of Jerusalem. Now, Nehemiah also had problems with the leaders of tribes that had established themselves in and around the city of Jerusalem in the absence of the Jews. Men like uh, Sanballat and Tobiah and, and Geshem were kind of the ring leaders of the opposition to the Jews building up the walls and the defenses of the city of Jerusalem. The book of Nehemiah is the record of this man's leadership in getting it done in spite of the opposition that he faced. And he did it in only 52 days. And he did it with great opposition, as I said before. The book of Nehemiah is an excellent study in the principles of godly leadership and, and the principles of, of victorious Christian service. As a matter of fact, the building of the walls of Jerusalem by Nehemiah in only 52 days is considered even in our day to be a feat of almost unbelievable proportions. I mean, what this man accomplished in just 52 days is still looked upon with admiration because it was a very difficult task. And how he did it and how he brought it about is really a study in leadership and, and determination in, in spite of opposition. The city of Jerusalem had lain in ruins for many decades and, and the people were disheartened. There were enemies threatening on every side of the city. The people had returned. They had built their temple. They had instituted the laws and regulations of temple worship. The city walls had been reconstructed, but the people requested that one more thing be done. They built a platform and upon the platform, in, in the middle of the plaza, on that platform, they built a pulpit. And they asked Ezra the priest, the scribe, and his associates to read the law. And not only to read the law of Moses, but to explain it to them, to explain to them what it meant. The, Bible uses the term to give the sense of it. Uh, we might say to apply it to them. And for six hours, for six hours, Ezra and his associates did that. They read the law, 
They made the application for six straight hours. You know, you get complaints if you preach for 45 minutes, but in that day, it wasn't such a big deal. And, and for six hours, they did just what the people had asked them to do. And in response to that, in response to the teaching of the law, and in response to the application of the law to their lives, the Bible says that the people were moved to tears and they were moved to repentance as they began to understand God's word and the expectations the Lord had for his people and how short they had fallen of those expectations. And they are weeping, they are repenting, they are taking what has been said, what has been taught, what has been applied from the word of God. They are taking it seriously as always we should. It is in this context that this is what is going on when the words of our text are spoken. They were words of comfort and encouragement given to a people who were surrounded by enemies who mocked them, disparaged by those enemies for the work they were doing, in fact, at one point they said, you know, even a, even a little fox could come up against this wall and knock it over. They were disparaged in their work and, and they were faced by people who were much stronger than they were. And though they were Jews, they were new to the land. Most of them probably had not even been to Jerusalem before. They had never seen the land of Israel. They had only heard about it. They had been born and raised in Babylon. And many of them in their thinking, in their speaking, in their doing, were Babylonians. They were Jews by ethnicity, but, but in their training and educations, they were, they were Babylonians. They were from a pagan culture. And they were new to this land, and they were also new at this point to living their life in a right relationship to the Lord. They never heard this before. I have to believe that they were scared, too. New things are scary things. And I believe that they were scared as they faced the future in this new place. They had to be uncertain of themselves in this new spiritual relationship that they had. What, what exactly did this mean? That they are right with the Lord. What does it mean that they're going to try to live out the, the precepts and the principles of God's word? They were insecure about this. Realizing their state of mind. Ezra the priest tells them essentially there's no need for mourning. This is a time of celebration. You have repented of your sins. You have turned from your sins. You have committed yourself to the Lord to be his people. This is not a time for mourning. This is a, a time for celebration. And why? Well, he tells them why. He said, this is a time for celebration and not a time for mourning because the joy of the Lord is your strength. He's not denying the reality of their physical circumstance. What Ezra is doing is pointing them to the source of their joy and he was reminding them that as believers in the God of Israel, they needed to rest and to learn how to rest in the spiritual reality that existed at that point in their lives because of that relationship. You know, most of us spend a large portion of our lives trying to arrange our own happiness. We do that, but the circumstances of our life always seem to get away from us. They, they always seem to, to get in the way. We perhaps have an uncooperative spouse or 
we're dealing with a rebellious child or uh, we have financial difficulties or maybe we face some uh, illness that is affecting us in, in life-threatening ways. Maybe we've been dealing with, with un, unloyal friends or disloyal friends. Or, or maybe uh, we work with an overbearing boss or with people around us that we don't particularly like. And so our, our concern is our happiness. And we usually respond to those kinds of circumstances in one of two ways. We either, first of all, become a victim of that circumstance whatever it happens to be and we start feeling sorry for ourselves and 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 so we we take on the role of victim or we try to control the circumstances and we push buttons and pull strings and manipulate people and create scenarios that we think are going to work to serve our own happiness. And I, I see that all the time. I, I'm sure you do too. There are people who are always trying to control the circumstances and people around them. And here's the problem with that kind of living. You, you will never meet a happy victim. You're never going to meet a happy controller or manipulator. Happiness is elusive to us because there are so many things that are out of our control. You know that, and I do too. The strength we need for the issues of life that we face in this world system are never going to be found by the perfect arrangement of people and circumstances and things in our life. It didn't, it, it's just never going to happen. I cannot arrange my own happiness. I, 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 because I can't control circumstances. I wish I could. I can't control people. I wish I could. I can't create scenarios that everybody falls into place so that I will be happy. You know, in my humanness, I wish I could, but I cannot. And the sooner we realize that in our life, the, the sooner we're going to be on the path of finding out what life is really all about. So Ezra says to these people, you go and, and enjoy yourself. You celebrate this this time in your life because the joy of the Lord is your strength. What does he mean? What does it what does it mean that the joy of the Lord is our strength? Where does that come from? And how can I make it my own? This joy of the Lord that he's talking about. Well let me let me start by doing a little analysis of joy from a biblical standpoint. Uh, Nehemiah chapter 8, verses 1 through 12, and also the book of John, the Gospel of John, chapter 15 and verse number 11, is the text that I want to base this on. When I was growing up in church, if anyone asked you what joy was, the standard answer was Jesus first, others second, and yourself last. That's joy. That's how you find joy. Put Jesus first, others second, yourself last. Kind of an, an acrostic. I don't think that's a, a bad explanation necessarily. I just don't think it gets down to the heart of what joy is. Most explanations of joy ending up sounding an awful lot like happiness. And as we talked about last week, happiness depends upon happenings. My Webster's New World College Dictionary tells me that joy is a very glad feeling, happiness, great pleasure, 
delight. I think that misses what Jesus is talking about. I think it misses what Nehemiah talks about in Nehemiah chapter 8. But, but that definition, the, the dictionary definition, doesn't square with the context of the discussion of joy that I see in Scripture because the Bible is talking about something other than happiness. Joy is not an emotion in the way that happiness is. Although happiness may be mixed in with our joy, I'm not denying that, but joy is a spiritual state of being that enables the believer to deal properly with the circumstances of their life, whether good or bad, and in the process, adorn the gospel of God and bring glory to him. I can't do that simply by being happy. I can't do that simply because the circumstances of my life are going the way I want them to. Because they're not always going to go the way I want them to. People are not always going to be as they should be in my eyes. Joy deals with that reality. Happiness does not. The context of Nehemiah 8 and John chapter 15 are not happy occasions. Repentance is taking place in Nehemiah chapter 8. And in John chapter 15, well, John chapters 12 through 17, actually, we have betrayal and warning and rebuke and conflict. These are not happy occasions. Uh, read the gospel account of, of the Last Supper. That was not a happy occasion. These guys were bickering and fighting and, and positioning in themselves and politicking for who was going to be the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. They weren't happy. And, and in, in Nehemiah chapter 8, the word of God is being read, it is being applied, it is being proclaimed, and the people are under conviction, and they're weeping. This was not a happy occasion. And in, in both of these two scriptures, in both of them, the joy that is spoken of is related to a relationship not to a circumstance they were in or were about to face. The, the people of Israel were in a circumstance where they're surrounded by their enemies. They, they are not a warlike people. They didn't know what they were going to do. That wasn't, that wasn't happy for them. They weren't looking forward to the future. And the disciples were about to face the most horrible situation they had ever faced in their life within the next 24 hours. Jesus didn't talk to them about how happy they ought to be. He talked to them about joy. Ezra didn't talk to these people about living it up and, and having a great time and being happy and, and all of that. He wasn't talking about that. He talked to them about, about celebrating the reality of their relationship with Christ, yes, but he talked to them about joy. The joy of the Lord is rooted in an understanding of the truth of God's word. It is rooted in a submissive response to the principles and the precepts of God's word. It is rooted in a life that is committed to obedience to the laws of God's word. And it is rooted in the fruitfulness of life that results from all of that, that brings glory to God because of the attitude of heart and mind that that individual believer has toward God's word 
and toward the relationship they have with the Lord. In both of the examples that are given, the people who were involved in that event were led back to something other than themselves to find the joy that was being spoken of. And what that tells me is that joy is not about me. Like, like circumstances that I face, they're about me. It's how they affect me. That's not what joy is. Joy is not about me. It is something outside of me. Joy comes from the realization of what we have as believers in Christ. It's about his assurances and his promises and who we are in Christ as a result of that relationship with him. And I'm talking about the relationship of salvation. I'm talking about, if you are already a believer, I'm talking about the relationship of, of submission to, to him, to his will, to his word. And an understanding of those things and living in light of those things in our lives can enable us to be joyful whatever the circumstance we may be facing. And whoever the people are that we have to deal with and however disappointed we may be in the, in the present dilemma that we find ourselves in, I want you to note Nehemiah 8.12, the only thing, the only thing that had changed in this particular scene are the hearts of these people. Look, look at that verse, Nehemiah chapter eight and verse number 12. Then all the people began to eat and drink, send portions and have a great celebration because, now listen, there is a reason for this. There's a reason why they were not to grieve, why this is considered a time to celebrate, because they had understood the words that were explained to them because they had come to an understanding of the word of God. That's why this was a day of rejoicing. Their hearts had changed and yet they rejoiced. The Bible says, the King James says mirth, the uh, Christian standard version says, celebration, but it was on the basis of understanding the Word of God. So that an understanding of the Word plus application of the Word to my life results in joy. And if you look back at John chapter 15 verses 1 through 11, you'll find that Christ's great lesson on the vine and the branches, and, and he talks to the disciples about their relationship with him and their relationship with his word, and he concludes with this statement. I have told you these things, verses 1 through 10, I have told you these things so that my joy may be in you and your joy may be complete. He was talking to them about pursuing joy by abiding in Christ and abiding in his word and letting his word abide in them. Did the disciples get it? <laughs> no, they did not get it. Certainly not at that moment on that night before Jesus Christ died. They didn't get it because they were too busy jockeying for position in the kingdom. Did they eventually get it? Oh, yes, they did. Yes, they did. 
Their eventual understanding is illustrated for us in the book of Acts chapter 5, verses 40 and 41. Let me read that to you. It says, after they, the Sanhedrin is what that day, what that they refers to. After they called in the apostles and had them flogged, beaten, they ordered them not to speak in the name of Jesus and released them. Then they, and that they, they refers to the apostles. Then they went out from the presence of the Sanhedrin, rejoicing that they were counted worthy to be treated shamefully on behalf of the name. Rejoicing. They were filled with joy. Was it a good circumstance? No. These guys had just been beaten. They had just been publicly humiliated. They had, they had been flogged. They, they had been uh, berated. All of these things humiliated in, in a, a, a forum of religious leaders. And yet they left that, that place rejoicing. Were they happy with the circumstance? Absolutely not. Were they happy because they had been beaten? No, there was a higher purpose here. They rejoiced that they were counted worthy to be treated shamefully on behalf of the name. <clears throat> Remember the Ethiopian eunuch in Acts chapter 8, verses 26 through 39? I don't have time to explain the whole story to you, but if you want to, to read it, it's in, in Acts chapter 8, verses 26 through 39, just a few verses there. Philip was holding a revival, and God said, I want you to go out into Gaza, which uh, is desert. I want you to go out there. I've got something there I want you to do. And so Philip obeyed, and he went out, and, and he saw a chariot coming down the road, but it had uh, a... Uh, a man in it, his, he was the treasurer of Queen Candace of Ethiopia, but he had come to Jerusalem to worship, and while he was there, he had purchased a copy of Isaiah chapter 53, and he was reading it as they were going along, and, and the uh, one who was uh, steering the chariot came to a stop, and, and Philip got, got on to the chariot with this man, this high official, and uh, he saw what he was reading and he asked him, he said, do you understand what you're reading? And the man said, how can I understand it unless somebody explains it to me? And so Philip started at that point and he explained to him about Jesus Christ and what Christ had done. And this, this particular chapter is speaking of Jesus Christ, the savior of the world and what Christ had done. And the Ethiopian eunuch got saved. And he finally asked uh, Philip, he said, here's some water, what hinders me from being baptized? And so they went down into the water and, and he was baptized and Philip got up and was taken by the spirit to another place. And the Ethiopian got into his chariot and took off. The Bible says he went on his way rejoicing. On what basis? It was because of the truth that he had understood from God's word and the fact that he had submitted himself to it, it resulted in joy in his heart. When Christ sent out the 70 in Luke chapter 10 and they came back giddy with, with the, that the demons submitted to them in Christ's name. And Christ said to them, don't rejoice that the demons submit to you, but rejoice that your names are written in heaven. He pointed them back to an eternal truth. Paul talks about rejoicing in Romans 5, 1 through 5. And it's all based upon his relationship with Christ and the spiritual realities in his own life as a result of that relationship. Because of that relationship, 
Paul says, I can always rejoice in my afflictions because I understand that God uses them to bring me to greater spiritual maturity and to greater spiritual understanding. I can rejoice in that. I, I don't enjoy the, the difficulty, but I can rejoice in the fact that I understand from the truth of the word of God that God is perfecting me. He is maturing me. He's making something out of me for his glory that I would never become otherwise. The point to be made in the scriptures is that the joy of the Lord is bound tightly to our relationship with him and to the understanding and application of his truth in our lives. It's not the, the giddy feeling of happiness that I, I feel because I stand in a good place in my life. That, that isn't the joy the Bible was talking about. There's nothing wrong with that. Don't misunderstand me, but that's not what he's talking about. That's not the joy he's speaking of here. This joy that, that Ezra talked about, this joy that Christ spoke about, that Paul spoke about, that Simon Peter spoke about, this joy is not the slap happy, uh, drummed up good vibes kind of happiness that is often peddled in so many churches today through feel good sermons and upbeat music and positive affirmations. I remember several years ago, uh, there was a, what was called a laughing revival. And, and it was so silly and so sacrilegious and so out of place that it, it just about made me ill. That's not what God is talking about. We don't make fools of ourselves by rolling in the aisles of churches, laughing at nothing in particular. That's not joy. God wants us to be joyful in our life, and he has, he has provided the means for us to be joyful through a relationship with Christ and then nurture that relationship through a growing understanding of his word. My prayer for, for all who listen to me today, and I, and I hope I've been clear, I hope I have, have been able to convey to you what the Bible is talking about when, when Ezra said, the joy of the Lord is your strength. You can face those enemies around you because of what you know and understand of God's word and what his plan is for your life. And the same is true with Christ and the other men of the Bible who spoke to us about the joy of the Lord. My prayer is that all of us will make joy the pursuit of our life and not be content <clears throat> to settle for just being happy. Because when we do that, when we're content just to be happy, we shortchange ourselves. And we miss God's plan and purpose for our lives. Strive to be joyful because it beats being happy. One last thing. I want to talk for just a couple of minutes about the reward of joy. In closing today, I want us to look at three scriptures that give us some insight into the reward and the benefit of pursuing joyfulness. Uh, there are many more than just these three, but these will help us understand the great benefit there is in making this our pursuit. In John chapter 15, uh, verses 1 through 11, uh, I'm just going to make these points, make a couple of statements, and be done. First thing, as far as a reward of joy is, is that we will find security in our relationship with Christ. The Christian life is about a relationship with the Lord. And there are many who profess faith in Christ 
who are not secure in that relationship, and maybe that is you listening to me today. But the pursuit of joy drives us back to the truth of the word because that's where joy is going to be found. Because truth is going to lead us to a greater intimacy with Christ. And that greater intimacy with Christ is going to produce, says in John 15, it's going to produce fruit, more fruit, and much fruit in our life. And that fruit, more fruit, and much fruit, that maturing process glorifies the Father. And the end result of that is joy in our life because we understand that what God has saved us for, the purpose he has saved us for, is being accomplished through our life, and that brings joy. Second thing is found in Nehemiah chapter eight and verse number 10. Second reward of joy is that we will find strength to handle the opposition of our enemies. As the Jews were getting things right inside the walls, they did so with the understanding that their enemies were not at rest outside the walls. And we have to understand as believers in Christ, there's always going to be opposition. There's always going to be opposition to us when we determine to live our life in a closer relationship with the Lord. Always. Jesus told the disciples, in this life, you will find tribulation. The Apostle Paul says, Yea, and all that will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. There's always going to be opposition when we make that determination that we're going to live our lives for Christ. But the pursuit of joy and the nurturing of joy, that joy that we have in Christ, is going to help us view that opposition in a different way and, and find the spiritual strength we need to face it and to deal with it in a way that is going to honor the Lord and bring glory to his name. So we will find strength to handle the opposition of our enemies. And then finally, we will find stability in the face of temptation. James chapter one, verses two and three, my brethren, count it all joy when you fall into divers temptations. For tribulation worketh patience, but let patience have her perfect work that you may be perfect and entire, wanting nothing. We will find stability in the face of temptation. Uh, we can consider the temptations of life joyfully as a believer in Christ because we understand from God's word that the Lord is using that temptation to bring spiritual maturity, spiritual stability, Christ-likeness into our lives. That's the process of our pursuit of joy. And each one of us who know Christ in salvation have Christ's joy in us. He tells us that in John 15. But it's our responsibility, yours and mine, to nurture that joy into that pattern of our life so Christ is our life. He is our life in thinking, in doing, in saying, and in motivation. And when that is the case, in your life or in mine, the Father is glorified, we are fruitful, and we will almost, without awareness, find ourselves joyful. That's what the Lord wants in your life. It's what he wants in mine. And I pray that that will be our pursuit. Father, I pray today for those who have listened, I pray that you'll use this message to encourage, to challenge, 
and, and if need be, to bring someone to faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Help us to pursue joyfulness, that we may honor you with our life, that we may adorn the gospel of God, and that the Father might be glorified, and the end result will be that we experience the joy that Christ promised and that he spoke about in your word. We ask in Jesus' name, amen. Thank you for joining us today. Hope you have a good day and hope to see you again next week.